Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments, changes? Okay, motion then to approve. So moved. So moved. Uh, Second. Uh, Second for Chris, okay. All in favor? Opposed, no. Very good. No, you need to. I'm going to okay. abstain, Charlie. Okay, right. Very good. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So before you again this evening, you have the Hillside Drive uh, Street Acceptance Plan to be endorsed. And the board may recall that this came before the Planning Board and the Board of Selectmen and Town Meeting last year. And unfortunately, the documents were not recorded at the registry in a timely manner. We have 120 days after Town Meeting to do that. And unfortunately, that step was met, missed, rather. So it needs to be done over. So you see the difference this year is that there were two parcels at the end of the cul-de-sac that were sold. Actually, Rowley's, John and Linda Rowley actually bought two parcels that they've combined into one. And they're building a single family home there now. And you'll see the small sliver of land that is labeled as parcel C in 28 square feet. And then Ian and Michelle Neal purchased the piece of land across on the other side of the cul-de-sac and you'll see a small parcel B of 507 square feet. So since these lots had conveyed, I needed them to sign a waiver of appraisal and damages, which they've both done, and the Neal's bank has released that section of land and that will become um, part of the right-of-way for the edge of pavement that's there. So the plan does meet the requirements. I would recommend the board endorse the plan submitted. I would like you all to stay at the end of the meeting and endorse the Mylar so we can file that with the selectman's office and put a copy on file with the town clerk tomorrow. Very good. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments on it? If not, we'd have a motion then to, enjoy, uh, to uh, endorse the A&R. So moved. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. And Jeff? I'm in favor. Say yes. Jeff? Uh, yes, yeah, yes, in favor. Great. Very good. Thank you. I keep looking over there like he's up there. It's not quite 635. Do you want to start on your update? <coughs> sure. So on the update, I don't really have too much. Um, just a reminder that the annual town meeting will be held on June Monday, June 6th at Tantasqua High School. We do have our budget, and there are a number of important articles, so I'd encourage everyone to attend. Our next meeting dates are June 14th. We will have a uh, public hearing for the sign for the new auto zone that is going um, at, in part of the former J.C. Penney location. So that will be on June 14th. As of right now, we have nothing on June 28th, and if you do, I won't be here. I'm on vacation. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll try to keep <laughs> Excuse me, and I will also, the next public hearing for Blueberry Hill Estates, I will recommend that we continue that public hearing after this evening until July 12th at 6.35 p.m. Um, I'll go over the reasons why when I do my intro to that project. And Great, and we don't have that. anything at the town meeting that we're reporting on, right? No, we don't. We have the our budget, and we have... Actually, the housing partnership, I've worked up with them on the housing trust documents. Um, that was one of the recommendations in the housing plan that the planning board supported or adopted. Other than that, we have no zoning or anything this year. Okay, great. So. Okay, I think it's 6.35, so we can have a continuation of the public hearing. Yes. Jean, do you want to lead in on this? Yes. Um, so you don't need to read the legal notice again. We did that at the last meeting, but just kind of a recap of uh, where we are with this project. So the board will recall that this is a 71-unit, 55 and over manufactured housing community that will be constructed on Lot 3 on Berry Farm Road, which is the small cul-de-sac that is being built off of Main Street, Route 131. There will be a clubhouse and optional garages for the residents of the neighborhood. And we have begun review of this project. You do have some comments from uh, Board of Health agent. 
the conservation agent and the fire inspector and building inspector as of this date. And John Shevlin from Park Corporation has been retained to conduct a peer review of the project and you have his initial comments that we received late this afternoon. Um, since the project is still under review and based on John's memo, there are a number of items that will still need to be addressed. I would recommend that you allow the applicant to make their presentation, obviously have questions from the board and from the public, and hopefully a lot of those maybe could be answered this evening, and if not, we would work to get answers for the July 14th meeting, and hopefully at that time we'll have all of the staff and peer review completed and be able to issue a final report. Very good. Thank you. And we have with us this evening um, Justin Stelmach, John Stelmach, and Peter Engel from McClure Engineering that will be presenting the project. We all right, yeah? Yep. And can just grab another chair, Justin, a yeah. third to the end there. <laughs> Musical chairs. <laughs> Gene, did you hand out a copy of this? No, I didn't. Okay. I can do that, though. <coughs> right. Does anybody in the audience want one? And yeah. Two, one, one <coughs> yeah, so right. would you like them? I'll hand them up. Okay. So we just put together, first, I'm Justin Stalmach, one of the applicants. Uh, we just put together a quick four or five page packet just kind of shows the overall site plan, uh, some interior and exterior pictures of manufactured homes and then some floor plans. Uh, we know there's been some questions out there, manufactured housing, what is it exactly? So we just thought that that may be beneficial um, to also give to anybody in the audience. Um, so I know we were in uh, almost two years ago now with a concept plan on this, so it's been a long time. Um, but what we have tonight is, as Gene said, is our definitive plan for a proposed 55 and older manufactured housing community, uh, 71 units with optional garages and decks, and, um, and also a uh, clubhouse with some open space. Uh, I know on our plan, which I don't know if you can bring it up, Pete, around the clubhouse what we've put is um, a pickleball court and then some community gardens. Our plan with that would be to have some residents move in first and then get an idea of what the residents would actually want for that area. That just kind of gives an a, a idea of the space that we have for open space up there. Um, being a manufactured housing community, it would be privately owned and maintained by John and myself once it's fully built out. Residents would purchase their homes and then pay a monthly uh, land lease fee. That would cover your sewer, the water, real estate taxes, trash removal, sanding and plowing of the roadways maintenance of all of our rain gardens for our storm water. Uh, essentially no burden on the town except for emergency vehicles uh, from time to time. Uh, so on our original concept plan, I know we had traditional catch basins and retention ponds. We've essentially done away with those and come up with uh, a more of a low impact development with Gene's help and with uh, Becky's help over the last couple of years um, where we have rain gardens in between each individual home and then some larger ones throughout the uh, throughout the community to handle all our stormwater. Um, you know, and then also just through the manufactured housing bylaws, it allows us to have um, smaller lots, which gives us, uh, creates less of an impact on the overall land. In the packet that we handed out, uh, it works out to about 41 and a half acres is the total parcel. But of that, over half, about 58 and a half percent is gonna stay as forested area which you can see you know, is kind of the wooded area around all the highlighted green. And then the highlighted green area is um, about another, I think it was 24%. Uh, so total as far as green area, open space between the rain gardens, the grass areas and the trees, it's about 82% of that whole parcel stays as open space. So I mean, another way that low impact development allows us to have less of an impact on the overall land. <clears throat> so I know in the packet we submitted a phase construction approach. We have five phases. Uh, we've gone over that with uh, PD and fire, and they have given the okay as far as that construction schedule. Um, and then Pete, I know, can provide more comments on the, there are more information on the fire comments. 
And then as far as conservation, we went into our first meeting April 21st and Oxbow is in the process of doing their peer review uh, to hopefully have that back for the June 23rd meeting. So, so that's overall a quick update on our project and, and where we're at and overview of it. So I don't know if there's any questions from the board or Pete can expand on anything from the engineer side. Does anyone have any questions from the board at this point? I think we're all set to go ahead. Uh, so, like Justin said, the stormwater uh, design is kind of low impact, uh, only one detention basin in the middle here. It's an infiltration basin. Everything else is rain gardens. We have some larger ones down here. Um, eventually, we'll, you know, grow in and almost be un not noticed. Um, otherwise, it's rain gardens between every unit, um, almost like a landscape strip separating the yards, but also collecting road runoff, roof runoff. Um, treating it, detaining it, um, some providing infiltration depending on whether they're on the fill versus the cut side. Um, and, you know, it, it was mainly conservation's um, recommendation to try to eliminate those basins, which we've done. Um, so as far as the stormwater, I, you know, I think from our first conservation meeting, they were happy. The peer review comments came back pretty good. Um, some minor tweaking to do as we move forward, but the stormwater system, unless there's any issues with the board, um, seems like this is the best route for everybody. Uh, as far as water and sewer, um, Berry Farm Road, um, which is being constructed right now, uh, will tie into Main Street as well as Fisk Hill with water for a looped line. So this project would tie into that water main, which has already been approved. Uh, as well as the sewer, uh, that subdivision road will also have sewer up the Main Street. Uh, this project will have a mixture of gravity and forest main sewer. There'll be eight pump stations. Uh, each one will connect into a, a two-inch force main, which runs throughout the entire roadway system. Uh, there's a low point in the site right here, so the gravity sewer, which is out in the subdivision road, is higher. So we pump up to that gravity sewer, and then that um, ties into the main sewer network out in Main Street. Uh, proposing the emergency access, which was part of that subdivision road conditional approval. Um, right now, I think we have it proposed as a gravel access up to a portion to a high point here, and then from that high point out to, uh, I believe it's Crestwood Drive in Southbridge, it's pretty flat. Um, we're proposing basically a reinforced turf. Um, it's a basically a plastic. Um, I don't know what to call it. Like a, like grid, a plastic grid, mat a grid. grid that you fill in with uh, dirt and allow it to grow in with grass. So, so it's a it'll likely, likely never be used. Um, eliminates extra unnecessary pavement, but it's designed to carry the uh, carry the capacity of a ambulance or a fire truck or anything like that. Um, two emergency gates so we don't get unwanted access from Crestwood Drive as well as unwanted exit from the site out to Southbridge. Excuse me, Pete, could you talk a little bit about our meeting we had with Southbridge? On yeah, so as far as Southbridge, uh, the town planner is concerned. There's really the only permitting with the town of Southbridge is for a driveway permit. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, I forget what year, maybe like 10 years ago, uh, this property owner approached the town of Southbridge to try to get a uh, access easement through this area. So the town of Southbridge owns this little parcel here. So what they did, and the town of Southbridge was also planning on doing a water tower up in here, which they never did, but they basically uh, traded access easements. So this area, the town of Southbridge has an access easement over. In this area, property owner, which will be the Stelmox, has access over, uh, and then this is just the town right of way. So the only permitting that we will need to do that access is a driveway permit through the DPW. I did attend that meeting as well. Okay, is there more that you have, or? I think that's pretty much it. Um, 
We have an O&M plan that we submitted um, as part of our packet too, and basically lays out exactly how we're going to maintain the sewer, the water, the rain gardens, all done by professional uh, companies that we'll hire, and that'll all get lumped into the lease land fee that's paid every month to cover all that maintenance. Okay, very good. Excuse me, Charlie. Could maybe they could go over the sidewalks and um, pedestrian amenities within the development, please? Sure. Um, so the roadway, 20 feet wide yep. per the manufactured housing um, regulations, proposing a four foot wide bituminous concrete sidewalk on one side uh, of the roadway. Uh, I don't, we, we're not proposing a grass strip. I don't think it's required as part of the manufactured housing community. Um, that's part of the subdivision regs, but trying to kind of keep everything Tighter. Yeah, we want to keep everything as close together again trying to limit our impact because especially coming in on road a we have wetlands on both sides and vernal pools so by eliminating that three foot grass strip it just allows us again to kind of bring everything a little bit closer uh, also with the rain gardens especially on the sidewalk side what we have to create is basically culverts underneath each sidewalk so having that three foot grass strip created another issue on how to get the water from the roadway into those rain gardens. So. And that sidewalk will basically connect every road to the clubhouse as well as out into the subdivision, which has sidewalks on both sides. There'll be sidewalks out to Main Street and along Main Street as part of that approval. Um, so the entire site will be accessible for pedestrian traffic. And then I know we also we have fire hydrants per the subdivision rules and regs and then also street lights. Or the, the rules and regs. And um, street trees, proposing street, tree. street trees uh, per the subdivision regulations, as well as those rain gardens, which will provide increased landscaping on that roadway. Yeah, we'd be proposing uh, one street tree per lot just because we have the 75 feet of frontage, roughly a 20 foot floor or 24 foot <coughs> wide driveway, and then add in the rain gardens and the swales we need in front of them. We feel it really only leaves room for one tree per lot. You know, we don't want to plant too many trees and then over the years have them all grow into each other and, and cause problems. So. Okay. Did you want to go over any of the other uh, pages on that presentation as far as the manufactured homes themselves? Um, or? Yeah, so the first page we have the, the overall site map, which we, we kind of already discussed where we have, you know, the over 24 acres of, call it true open space where we're not touching the woods at all. Uh, and then the grass in the natural areas, the, you know close to another 10 acres and then the roads and buildings is about seven and a half acres um, got us to about that 82 percent of green area when construction is all said and done um, and then on the next pages we just we put in um, you know a couple of exterior pictures of manufactured homes this is all actually off of the website from the factory that we would be working with out of Pennsylvania uh, so these are actual homes uh, that they offer in third page same thing is some interior pictures of you know what the what the homes look like nowadays i mean they truly are identical to stick built homes i mean energy efficient two by six construction in a lot of ways you can make arguments that they're built better than stick built homes because they have to come over the road at 65 70 miles an hour and so they're designed to withstand that impact uh, and then on the the last page is again just some floor plans that we believe we'd be offering uh, with some you know, some have some built-in porches. They're all two bed, um, uh, two bed, two bath, um, and then uh, some of them do have a third bedroom slash office. Uh, it would be more of an office, not a bedroom. You know, I mean, being 55 and older, there won't be more than two people uh, per home living up there. You know, and within our rules and regulations, we'll be able to specify that because the state allows us to do that um, through our rules and regs that have to be approved by the state and the AG's office and then obviously approved by the Board of Health as well and submitted to them so and so we can control the age of the people that are living up there so there is no worry about school age kids ever living there very good okay Dane do you have any questions or comments or? Um, John Shevlin's report covered a lot of my comments so good report John thank you We'll go into that in a few minutes then. I just wanted to end uh, this part of the presentation. Do we have anything else? Any 
then I'm fully caught up to speed and I'll right. save my nitpicking for later. All right, good. <laughs> I'll set everything here. Great. Okay, John, do you want to go over your? Sure, sure. So we did go through the, uh, the documents that were provided uh, that were on the website. Um, went through the, the plans, the stormwater report was our you know, major focus. Uh, I'll start off by just saying I don't think there's anything in here that cannot be addressed, uh, but there, I do have some questions in regards to the regulation between the subdivision regs and also the manufactured housing. I think I'm, yeah. I think I was trying to figure out which, which ruled on some of them. So some of these may be answered pretty easily by, by the applicant. But I, I, won't, I won't go through every comment. I'll just talk about some of the you know, more significant ones, I guess. Um, you know, just to go ahead and find out more in regards to what's going on subsurface. I know the test pit locations were on the existing conditions plan. I think I found two that are on the grading plan. But I, I just, if we could just go ahead and they're probably on there somewhere. So it could be, could be. Yeah, I think we did 24, 25 test pits up there total. Yeah. yeah. So if you get that, if I could just uh, get more information on that or, or look at that. Just a question in regards to uh, Drive C, uh, that cul de sac's 500 feet. I know it's uh, required, you know, anything, or I'm sorry, exceeds 500 feet, anything over 500 feet. I, I believe if I read that, you know, we need a waiver. Not I'm not sure this, manufactured. Not in the manufactured. There you go, so yeah. that's an easy answer for you. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in that as well, just as far as the water main, I know they talk about anything over 500 feet, they should be considered to be looped, but I'm not sure the water department had any opinion I on that yet? I haven't received anything yet from them, so I, I will follow up with water. Okay. I don't know, Pete, if you've had any conversations with Shane about this. I know we yeah. talked about um, the subdivision itself being looped. Right. From what my conversations with Shane have been is that as long as it's staying as a private um, development, water and sewer, he really doesn't care what they do. Mm -hmm. He only cares when it ties into the road then everything is town standards, which it is on the subdivision. So um, he really had no opinion. Obviously, it's, you know, we're trying to do the best we can with doing hydrants and, and making sure the water pressures get there. I mean, we need a water booster station for anything past phase one. Um, and even with that, Shane has basically said he doesn't really want or need to know what's going on with that booster station doesn't have to be to town standards because he's not going to be the one maintaining it. Well, we'll probably have a little discussion about that because, of yeah. course, it is going to be town water that's going to go through there. So we want to make sure everything stays in the yeah. pipes. Okay. I'll follow up with Shane. <laughs> that was kind of the information I got, too. <laughs> we can uh, talk to the DBW director about yes, that. Yes, I will. Um, some of the other comments, uh, you know, Drive A, you know, just reading the regs, you know, is that considered a major road? Um, you know, with that in play, if it is a major road, we have a uh, minimum, minimum radius. We have a radius of 150 feet, and I'm just curious whether that's that acceptable. Doesn't apply. Doesn't apply. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm sorry here. I marked this one. Oh, you did. All right. Yeah. Just. Okay. Those were the two we talked about. Yeah. 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 Um, radius at side streets. Um, I know we're showing some curb radius at 20 feet. I think it mentions in the regs that needs to be 30 feet. That doesn't apply. Does apply. I'll have to check that one. <laughs> it's and just for clarification of the board and the audience, so the manufactured housing bylaw refers some things to the subdivision regs and others it sets its own standard. So and we've been flipping back and forth between the two trying to figure out which sections apply to what. So um, you'll have to bear with us as we go through this. It's been in my tenure here, we've never approved a new one, only the expansion of the Sturbridge Retirement Cooperative. So so, patience. <laughs> Excuse me, Charlie, interrupt. Whoever is driving over there, would you mind putting the big picture back up for this conversation, please? Thank you. Just on the um, grading and drainage plans, uh, just in the review, there's some uh, more of a drafting thing, just some legibility as far as some of the numbers, just to check. So, I'll work with you offline, Pete, just in order to get that information. Uh, the phasing plan, I know you had a separate phasing plan that was provided, and then the ones in the plan seem like there's uh, some difference on those. I think the one in the plan set showed phase one, and then up further as you head, I guess north showed another portion of phase one. I think it was just a, a typo on that area. <clears throat> um, approach on, uh, on plan and profile for drive A. Um, grading intersection, you know, we have a 2% uh, that's requested or required to be 100 feet. Uh, ex extended to 100 feet. I think it was pretty short duration that we had. I think it looked like we had enough for queuing to one car. 
we just take a look at that as far as see what can be done with that. Um, the profile, if we just get elevations on the profiles, uh, just down there, just a check back over the plans again, pretty much minor stuff. Then there's just some detailed information as far as the bitumen sidewalks, the uh, the depth, the thickness of that, and the sub base. Um, just again, going by the regs, we take take a review of that area as well. Um, and there's some other just details, just minor markups that I think will be pretty easy to, to review and answer. And as far as the stormwater design goes, you know, Pete did a good explanation regarding what we're looking to do. You know, certainly does incorporate a lot of BMT, BMPs. Um, you know, the style, the country style drainage that they have, and the use of the infiltration basins, the rain gardens. It does meet the the, uh, the need as far as the um, reduction in, in water uh, volume, and it certainly goes in and meets the need for water quality. So. Uh, they did answer all the stormwater standard uh, questions, um, and I think basically they answered them all correctly. And based on the analysis review, and then also just the layout, you know, I see no issues in regards to the stormwater as, as the way it's uh, the way that's been laid out. So, um, you know, and that's you know those items, and I think um, you know just going back to the plans, I'm just looking to see if there's anything else. You know, I think we talked about some of the most of them already. Um, I think one thing that I had at the end in regards to, you know, in the rain gardens, you know, our experience has been with the mulch. I believe you're looking to put mulch down. It's been tougher to maintain, but I know you have an O and M plan that's pretty, pretty aggressive as far as monthly maintenance. Um, I know we've been recommending that some products use uh, stone, but just something to consider whether that's a better option or not. But. Um, Light detail, um, I know you're providing lights, just have a detail in regards to what the, the light's going to be like. And then the snow uh, removal and storage, um, I'm not sure that's been addressed anywhere. I think it mentioned in regards to the o and plan that there will be a plan put in place. Um, but just if there's more information in regards to where that and how that's going to happen, it would be, be good to know. So it's a brief summary in regards to, you know, we're not going to every comment, but um, certainly going to answer any questions or Go into more detail if need be. And Charlie, I have some staff comments to add to okay, that. Go ahead. Um, so, from the health agent, which I've provided these to the applicant, we just received these. Um, as they are aware, they need to apply to the health department for a permit to operate the manufactured home park. I think um, Justin mentioned that. And they said additionally, attention should be given to trash and pest management, which I know you, we talked about a lot about that as well. And then um, one thing, they said special consideration should be given to providing an emergency shelter for the residents of the park. More conversation shall occur during permitting with the Board of Health, but this should be considered during this design stage. So, and I spoke with Ken Lacey a bit this <coughs> afternoon, and he was wondering if there was maybe some provisions that could be made in the clubhouse. So, in extreme emergency, if there were, you know, some shelter in place options for people that don't have basements and things like that. So I don't know what you've done in some of your other facilities, but something to think about as you move forward in the design. And I know they'd like to have a discussion with you about that. Yeah, on, on that item, I did notice that. I mean, I would think we'd also want to have a discussion with our emergency management yes. director on this because, I mean, primarily our emergency management plans are town wide. I mean, right. we try to protect everybody, not mm -hmm. just the people who are going to be in this 71 unit place. So right. I'm surprised that they put that forward as some sort of a requirement. <coughs> Is that something in the health requirements that actually exists, or was it just Ken's idea? Well, actually, uh, he asked me if anyone from emergency management had chimed in with that. Any thought to incorporating this into our emergency management plan? Yeah. So we basically I, have one shelter, maybe two, we when do. we need it, and that's for the whole town. And right, and so they were talking about like um, distance to that. So we did something similar with Crescent Gate. Um, I remember when that was permitted, we had, you know, almost kind of like these temporary stopgap measures. So right. if need okay. be, they kind of you know shelter at one area until they could be you know get someplace safe. Okay. So just something to think about. And then the other comments that we had were um, building inspector said he had no objections. Um, conservation, you're aware of the process that they're going through now with the Conservation Commission. And then the fire inspector had um, some questions on maneuvering and um, of the apparatus through the access roads. And it probably would be wise for maybe you to reach out with Jen or I can even set up a meeting for you to meet with her to go over those things with her as well. Um, but nothing, um, nothing real major at this point. Nothing real major at this okay, point. Okay, great. Staff. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, any questions now? Uh, Dane, do you have anything you want to add? Or? Wally, comments, questions? Sue? Yes, Good. Okay. This will open up to the public. If you have a question or comment, just make sure you go to uh, the microphone and also identify yourself and where you live. Can you just want to use this microphone? Yes. Just come stand over here and use my microphone. How's that? Do I have to hold it up? Or? No, I can just pick you up, I think. Oh, hi. Uh, Carol Goodwin, um, 19 Orchard Road, Sturbridge. Um, I have a number of questions um, because um, I know initially this was a 51 unit development, I believe, and um, all of a sudden it was 20 more units. And I was wondering, I mean, I'm sure it's to make more money, but I was wondering, that was a big jump. So I, um, what, what, what? So originally it was, I think it was 65 is what we had on the concept plan. 65? 65. Sit, um, and then that was just a concept plan, you know, where we don't really get into all the grading and the infrastructure and everything. So once we got into that in more detail, it proved out that the way we designed the roads, it added an additional six units. Okay. Now, um, one of my major concerns is I know you have, you have the access road off of 131, right, Berry Road. Um, coming in, but the only emergency access is through Southbridge. Yep. So what if there's an, a major accident, say right in the beginning of that road? Is Sturbridge Fire Department or emergency vehicles going to go to Southbridge to come in? Is that if what's going to have to happen? If there was a, an accident where they couldn't get... Yeah, the because the roads road. are only 20 feet wide. I mean, this is one of the problems I have with this, is the, the, the and I know it's allowed. <laughs> You know, I know this is in the regs, and I know you guys will do what you, you know, follow the regs. But to me, it's dangerous because that's a very tight development. And um, I just, uh, my father was a firefighter, so I'm very aware of these things, you know. And I, I, to me, it seems like a very dangerous situation where you have to have storage emergency vehicles go through Southbridge to get in. So just so I understand correctly, you're saying if there was a accident within our development, like at in, the the entrance, in the beginning, in right at the beginning, or you know anywhere, because it's over 55 people yeah. or older. Yeah. So within all of our communities, you know, we we specifically have speed limits, and I think in Massachusetts, like I I believe, but I, in their in their suggested rules and regulations, it's 15 miles an hour in most of our communities that we own and operate now were eight miles an hour. So the possibility of a major accident where it's gonna block off that 20 foot wide road for a long period of time, mm -hmm. I mean, can't say it'll never happen, but I would think it's highly but unlikely. 11, 11 years ago, was we, we had a tornado. Mm -hmm. and, it, and this is another one of my concerns. You don't have cellars. I went right down into my cellar when that, when I called all my kids and they all went in their cellar. And, in like the clubhouse should probably have a cellar. So the clubhouse has a 10 foot deep foundation and that was one thing we just saw the Board of Health comments tonight. Um, so <coughs> we will work with the Board of Health to come up with a plan with that. We see I mean, the clubhouse is just over 1200 square feet is what's proposed based off of the uh, bylaws. So that would be a perfect area for people to be able to shelter in place. Uh, I know you, you do see on the news sometimes out in the Midwest where a tornado comes through and yes it does can take these homes out. These homes are designed to what they call wind zone one, two, and three. We're here in Sturbridge in a wind zone one so that's all designed by the engineers and then these homes are tied down and anchored to concrete pads. So that's more for hurricanes and tornadoes but if say a hurricane came through the way these are required to be secured to the ground. I mean, they'll move back and forth, but they will not come off the blocks, and they will not get, We hope. You know, we hope. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's the idea with what's designed in the Well, we had, it was pretty, right through that whole area, really. So we, you know, yeah. we never would have believed it would have happened in Sturbridge. And there was just one, I think, in Michigan or something. Yeah. But to ultimately answer your question, I mean, if there was some kind of major accident or emergency, emergency vehicles couldn't get through from the Sturbridge side, they would go up and come down through the emergency access where uh, we'll provide, there's gonna be knock boxes on the gates with keys. Mm -hmm. So all emergency vehicles in the town will have a key to that to be able to get through. I don't know, that seems like not enough access to me. But anyway, um, also the rain gardens. I know this um, whole area 
like most of the disturbage doesn't, you know, it's, it's certain areas are very imperm um, not penetrable. Mm -hmm. The perk um, rate and, and with rain guns, I'm wondering, do you hit ledge? Because I know it's a very ledgy area. And um, so how does that, I mean, I'm, I'm totally for something like that. I mean, I'm, I, but I'm just curious where this land is fairly, you know, rock based. I'll, I'll let Pete. He can answer that better as the engineer. Yeah. So where the rain guards are proposed in ledge or close to bedrock or in groundwater, those particular rain gardens are going to be lined with a poly barrier, basically. It's a impermeable plastic liner. Um, so that water won't be going into the ground. It won't be taking on groundwater. Uh, all that water that goes through it will be treated, detained, and then sent out through an outlet. So sent out where? To downhill. Downhill. Oh, oh, if, I see. As you're coming in on the development, say on the right hand side, yeah. that's that'll be a cut. And mm -hmm. there are areas there through our test pits that you know we may hit ledge, um, mm -hmm. mainly for utilities, but that's where we would have the lined rain gardens mm -hmm. where like Pete was explaining the water will get into it, it'll drain down through, get treated, and then there's at the bottom of every rain garden there's a series of pipes. Then that water would get sent essentially underneath the road through the pipes into a level spreader, mm -hmm. which is stone that's on the other side and on the uh, fill side on the hill, and where then it leaches back out and runs back down towards you know, the low lying areas. Now, I, I care a lot about open space. So, the open space you quoted around this area that's um, forested and everything, are you going to write it into the deed that it can't be expanded, this development can't be expanded on in this area um, so that, um, it, you know, it will remain green? We haven't come to that final determination, but we're pretty, with what we're showing on this plan, there's really no more development that could be done, again, because of the layout know, of the land. I know, but it would be much better if it's yeah. written into the deed, because, you know, that we, you're saying it's mm -hmm. permanent open space, but it's not permanent open space unless it's permanent. Understandable. And, and I, you know, this, uh, I, so I think that would be really an important requirement, and because you're 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 calling it that, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I think it's 55 and older. 55 and older uh, people have told us co because of COVID, you know, the green spaces we have in Sturbridge really saved them mentally in a lot of ways. Gave them the release, and I would, having the the green areas and it's such a densely developed project. Because what are the lot sizes? Uh, 75 by 100. That's what I thought. Yeah. So that's pretty tight, and um, so I think it'd be really healthy if that <coughs> were needed so, as such. It's in, in, you know, it's like you said, what a 41 and a half acre development, and so um, I think. I could. I'd just like to make a comment about the density that you just brought up. Um, back in 2007 and six, I believe there was a condominium project <coughs> approved on this site for 120 units. I went to every one of those meetings. I went to every one of those meetings. Originally started out at yeah. 200, then they brought it down to yeah. 120 because of the impact, because it, I believe it was an open community as far as children and so forth that require more services of the town. Okay, and that's why they dropped it. That's my remembrance of the reading of it. Yeah, so well. We've gone another. No, I appreciate what you're units, doing. You know, yes. down. You've, yeah, but, but you're not. A, you, but how much you don't have any affordable housing in yours either? That was a 25% affordable housing project. Now we're just starting a housing authority, right, Wally? It's looking at affordable housing, and what you're doing is raising the level of affordable housing we have to bring in town, so that it makes us more vulnerable to a 40B project like that. So because you have no affordable units. Which would be a great thing to have. That was my other thing I wanted to address. Yeah, we're, we're been, we've been fighting for years through our association. Believe me, I've been on the board and been in this business. I was born yeah. in a community, okay? And we've been fighting this on the board for over 45, 50 years to try to get the state to say that manufactured housing is affordable. And Charlie tried and, to. And we also, yeah, the Charlie did reason it they will not move that. On. We almost got it through when Senator Brewer was uh, in office. Yes. And uh, primarily because of the large manufactured home uh, project we already have in town. But unfortunately, the state wouldn't it's accept it. It's insane that it's not included. I totally agree you know, with truly, you. Truly, I mean, the concept is that it, it does become affordable for seniors to live in a house like this. I mean, that's right. really a whole other issue. Yeah, it's. 
even with everything that's gone on over the last two years now, and especially in the last year with the pricing on everything, it, this manufactured housing is still more affordable than a traditional stick-built home or condo. Um, you know, that's you, there's studies out there all over the place. We see it every day in, in what we do with our community. So, and we're still seeing it with this community here. We're just we're glad we just finished up two retirement communities in the town of Auburn and Leicester. One seventy five units, one thirty units. Um, and we sold our last unit what October? October of last year. Of last year of twenty one. <coughs> we're just so glad that we had already built and gone through so we didn't see that lumber increase mm -hmm. that we as over the last 10, 12 months. Uh, we did see a tremendous increase, but it, it just the, the prices are just scary what they've gone to. Sure. And, and we do have a traffic problem in Sturbridge because all our roads feed into 131 or Route 20. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it, and this is your right, I understand, but I, um, but I, it does have some impact on the community. So there was, as part of Matt's approval for Berry Farms, Road, there was, Berry Farms Road, there was a traffic study done in our project. I know they had to, for the <coughs> three lots, had to kind of give concepts of what may be built, but our project was used because it was a you know, known thing that we were coming in for mm -hmm. to try to get our approval. So that was all factored in. Okay, that's all. Those are my I only like questions. To, if I could just circle back to one other question you had about the rain gardens. Mm -hmm. it, what this plan is showing is the absolute maximum imperviable, impervious surface, surface yeah. area. And that's what these rain gardens are designed for. Um, they all are shown on this plan with two car garages and the largest unit that we can absolutely put on the lot mm -hmm. with the driveway. Taking that in consideration, the actual build, if we get approval and however many years down the road that it takes to build this site, I can guarantee you that not every single one of these units are going to be as big and have as much impervious surface mm -hmm. uh, because we just don't know what we're going to build as of yet. But I'm sure of one thing, there will be people out there that won't do a two-car garage, maybe a one maybe none, and also a smaller area for a roof. Um, but we're not going to make any adjustments to the rain gardens as going through. So the rain gardens, in theory, <laughs> in common yeah, sense, design. exactly. Yeah. They're going to be understand. functioning even better than what this plan is. And, I, and what John gave as a report seemed to be a pretty good report as far as how Pete and his crew designed this whole thing. I've, I've been in the building business for, uh, for 40 years building houses and believe me I look at this project and I look at the, the conservation efforts and, and the stormwater management it is by far the best project that I've been involved in and hopefully will be involved in in creating. Great. Um, so very good. Well, thank you. Great. Thank okay. You. Very good. Thank you, okay. Carol. <laughs> now does anyone else have any questions or comments they'd like to make? Yes. Come up and tell us who you are please. Tara Balunas, I live at Six Ridge Hill Road. Um, and you did answer a lot of my questions that I have, but I just kind of wanted to elaborate on a couple of them. Um, the first one being that we, um, we, I, my family frequently experiences um, high water levels, um, you know, in the winter due to the, um, you know, spring due to the snow melt. If there's a, a if we, get, we get several days of rain, you know, anytime that there's, um, you know, massive amounts of rain or snow melt, um, the water literally will come right up to the foundation of our house. Conservation is aware of this. We spoke to them when we first purchased the house. We were told that there wasn't really much we could do due to, um, they basically said there wasn't really much we could do. One of the reasons being that there's a spotted salamander population that lives over there. So um, I guess my question is, I know you talked about the rain gardens and you talked about the, the um, you know, what else, what are the storm water drains and all this stuff. Is that going to mean, is that going to contain 100% of that water? Because I'm afraid that even a little bit of extra water is going to even, is because this, this development is, is, uh, at a higher level than it everything drains down and my house is is downhill from this so i'm just wondering what your how much of that it's going to contain Pete. 
Great. So, no, it's not going to contain. Uh, there will be runoff. I mean, smaller storms, everything will likely be infiltrated into the ground. Uh, larger rainfall events, 10, 25 year storms, it's never going to hold all that water. It's, you know, five inches in 24 hours. Nothing in town's going to keep all the water on their property. But this whole property, um, you know, there's a very small portion that drains to this um, wetlands over here, which is behind your house, I'm assuming, uh, on Ridge Hill Road. Uh, this wetland is lower than Ridge Hill Road. Nothing is being discharged up into this area. So nothing, no stormwater is going to be discharged off-site higher than Ridge Hill Road. Right, but that's my concern about, not just my concern, I know that all of my neighbors on Ridge Hill Road have the same concern. Right. Because we're all, that, that um, wetland runs, it runs further to the right of where that picture is. It goes right down, right behind there's all a, of our houses. There's an outlet over here, there's like a stream or something. Yeah, there is but a stream, yes. We're not allowed to send more water there than, than what already goes there. So the analysis that we've done, the stormwater design that we've done, cannot exceed the current water levels that go to this, this and this has been approved by conservation no we're it's in that process okay. now, is there going to be a public meeting with conservation about this it was open our first meeting was april 21st oh i wasn't aware of that is there going to be another one uh, june 23rd june 23rd okay and then another thing that you had said earlier was that the water um was going to be sent um downhill where where whereabouts is downhill on that map so the majority of the site drains to this large wetland down at the bottom here um, like I said there's a small portion it's it's you know maybe this area that drains to this wetland everything else drains to these wetlands down at the bottom of the valley um, and all that wetland system drains to the north up towards um, the mass fish and wildlife property um, so no water is being discharged onto other roads, other neighbors' properties, um, the subdivision road. Everything goes into either this wetland or this wetland. Okay. See, that's my concern when you said that first wetland, because that first wetland impacts all of those houses up on Ridge Hill. Right. I, I think the important thing that he did mention, though, and it's been you know part of the Massachusetts stormwater law for many years, is that they can't allow any more water to leave the site than currently does. So after this development, they have to be sure that no conditions change to other properties. I mean, that's the whole purpose for this particular stormwater design. And had they used the culverts and so forth, it would be the same goal to make sure that no water that doesn't currently go off there uh, does go off there. So that's an important feature to all these plans. That's why they have to go through all this. That was all part of the peach stormwater uh, report that he did and then John's review. Okay. All right. And the, the good thing about this development, in my opinion, um, based on how many single-family residential developments that I've built, is that every single development that I've built, when you're done, you're selling the home and you're selling the lot all right, to the people, and then the town eventually takes the road over. Um, any restrictions that come along with the approval of that development then transfer and hopefully the neighborhood that is created at that time takes care of it. But in my experience, we all know that's not what happens. Okay, this being a privately owned community where we're going to be there constantly monitoring everything in that community. Um, that if anything ever did come up, we are there to fix it. We're still, the town has somebody to point a finger to. John and Justin, fix it. Even okay. if it's impacting residents that live downstream from that property, downhill from that property. Well, it's like we're going back and saying you, there are design standards, and this and this is designed to those standards. Okay. Can I predict anything that is a part? Anything is is almost a possibility. So I would never say. Right. All right. My second question is about the traffic study that was done. What were the what were the results of that? So that traffic study was for the subdivision based on conceptual development of all five lots on the subdivision road, including this one. That traffic study had to go to MassDOT since Main Street is a uh, MassDOT jurisdictional highway. Um, they approved the traffic study. They are putting in a uh, left-hand turn lane on Main Street into that subdivision road eventually. Um, but all that was reviewed by the state. 
been approved prior. Was it deemed how much extra traffic is going to be impacting that area of Main Street? Because I know even making a left to go up the hill towards my house is, is can be dangerous. Um, Just with the amount of traffic that's already currently was, flowing there. It wasn't, I don't believe there was a change in the level of service. Do you remember? No. No, I think with the turn lane that you're putting in, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the traffic on Main Street didn't have a decrease in level of service. And I think exiting the site, I think we looked at going ahead and potentially putting in a right turn or left turn lane. Mass DOT just wanted one lane for sight lines. And I think that's still operated at an acceptable level of service. Right. I want to say it was level of service C. C. Yeah. yeah. And really, until these other lots are maybe one day developed, I mean, this site is going to produce minimal traffic compared to what these other commercial properties could, could create. But the site plan, uh, the traffic study that was looked at and was approved, considered the full development of all those other properties right. and then it still maintained the level of service that's required okay right? i mean i'm assuming no, that asking the john our, our oh. uh, consultant yes. too yep so in other words level of service will not be deteriorated from this project right. from the study and from our peer review from john shovel <laughs> is there anything that's going to be done up towards the gas station or the end of fisk hill that or even the end of old Sturbridge road because there's you've got a lot of kind of heavy hitter sites with heavy traffic that are kind of all converging in this same I think area. John could maybe answer that yeah. better. Yeah, I believe what they're looking to do is just the improved access into the site by getting the, right now there is somewhat of a center turn lane. I think they're going to make that more of a dedicated left turn lane into the mm -hmm. site to get the turning traffic out of the traffic stream so you can maintain your traffic flow by the site. That should improve that area though, somewhat. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? Sure. Thomas Robbins, 45 Main Street. I'm basically exactly at the bottom of Fisk Hill that she's talking about, that bad turning there. Um, you guys came through and put a sidewalk on my side of the road and subsequently which took all of our mailboxes out and now put them at the bottom of their access point. I'll tell you right now, it's murder turning in there to get my mail. I stopped years ago trying to walk there and cross the street to get my mail because I almost got hit a couple times doing so. Where are my mailboxes going or are they going to be right there at the bottom? I'm going to have to fight 72 people and their cars coming in and out to go get my mail now. Because, and I'm asking the town, not them. That's where you guys put my mailboxes. Oh, Where are my mailboxes? We, we didn't put no. any sidewalks or the mailboxes postal, anywhere. Maybe yeah. Jane would so explain that. The postal service. Well, decides. you guys are the government, so yeah. where my, like. Yeah, we're not the we're, we're not the um, United States Postal Service, and they're the ones that determine where the post office boxes will be placed. Um, honestly, it didn't come up during the subdivision process, which is maybe where that should have come up. Um, I can reach out to the developer to see if it's going to be impacted at all, but... I'll tell you it's going to be impacted. I'm meant by the yeah. construction. I believe um, they already probably. started talks with the post office. Did they start talks with the post office? Or tried to. All right. Yeah. See, that wouldn't be anything yeah. that would come yeah. through us, so we would have no knowledge of that, unfortunately. Um, so I think I would reach out to the Postal Service and what Pete's saying is he believes the developer has already, not them, the developer that's building the subdivision road, it's a different developer, um, has been trying to reach out to the Postal Service. Yeah, because I've already not been able to get in and out of there because I've got trucks sitting there waiting to get in and out of the road. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's already getting rough to simply get mail. You know. I don't know if DPW or anyone would have Yeah, well, any certainly now that we're well, aware of it, I mean, we'll certainly could, follow um, up on it. We have your contact information on right. the sign-in sheet. Sure. Yeah. I'll yeah. try to follow up with DPW and see if I can get the appropriate contact for you okay. and see what can be done. I'm happy to look into that further. Thank you. You're welcome. And that was Tom Thomas? Yes. Robbins. Okay. Okay, any other comments, questions? Else? Anyone else on the board have anything else to follow up with? Let me just check the phone line. Oh, sure. Good idea. Oh, and Jeff. <laughs> and Jeff, Jeff do you have any comments or questions, Jeff? I do not. Okay, great. Is there anyone on the phone line that has any questions or comments regarding the 55 plus manufactured home community? Okay, so I guess we just... I'm sorry, Charlie. I, I just thought a couple comments here. 
On the uh, the sidewalk, I'm kind of hung up on this three inches of grass. I have a neighborhood that looks like a little subdivision that I like to go walking on, and that three feet of grass makes a big difference. You guys got a lot of land. You talked at length about how much extra land you got. I know that you're restricted with wetlands, and some of that extra land isn't exactly where it could be helpful, but I'd be hard-pressed to imagine you couldn't fit three extra feet of grass along that primary corridor, even the 500-foot stub that John was talking about. I would love if for the next meeting you guys could come back and try to do that and tell me exactly where it doesn't fit that we can't do it. You know what I mean? It's, it mainly comes down to the, the rain gardens and mm -hmm. how we're going to get the water through that grass strip, essentially, uh, because we did look at using that grass strip as a rain garden, but there was not enough area to be able to, to do that to meet the flows and, and peace calculations. it's only three feet wide, it's not enough, right? Correct, yeah. To make them wider. So they would have had, with what we have up there, each rain garden there is eight feet wide by 60 feet long. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would be impractical. I mean, I can't. It's not where I would, that's not my primary choice for a rain garden location, but. I just see a lot of land and a lot of opportunity, and I feel like three extra feet for a lot roadway, which is already only 20 feet wide, which I agree. I'd love to see a fire department turning radius confirm all these things, because some of those 20 foot radii could be 30 foot radii, as John mentioned in his report. I don't know specifically what the manufactured bylaws require for that, but looking at this, a lot of these look like pretty tight turns. Yeah, it requires 50 foot, and actually I will say that we've had, I believe, at least four meetings with police and fire chiefs to go over this plan as they've been developing it. And we did initially start with the grass strips, and then when Becky and I started talking to them about the environmentally sensitive nature of the project and asked if they could incorporate the rain gardens, that's when we ended up losing the grass strips in favor of the eight foot wide rain gardens. So that was kind of something that we went through in a variety of iterations trying to be sensitive to the you know the wetlands in the area and the vernal pools and we thought it also added a nice way to i don't know if you oh sorry have the rendering of the uh, rain garden with you but we also thought it was a nice way to add some plantings up towards the sidewalk as well so that was kind of a you know back and forth we had some conversations with john as well to try to see what could be accomplished so um yeah we, so that, that picture there yeah. is what gene was referring to we had um a peach landscape architect uh, designed that of essentially what two lots would look like with one of the rain gardens in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks nice. So uh, one other minor comment is trash for the clubhouse. Um, I didn't see a dedicated location for that, and I assume you'll figure that out. No, so I, I was I wanted to go back on that, and then a little bit on the phasing plan too, because I know John had brought up a couple of questions that there's kind of two phasing plans out there. Um, in regards to the trash and pest control, um, in all our other communities, we actively work with um, Ford's hometown service, who does all our pest control. So if there's ever an issue, mice, rats, anything like that in the community, then we we call them in. Um, it, it's mainly around the land portion. You know, if somebody calls and says, there's a mouse in my house, that's up to the homeowner because they own the home. If we have rats around trash areas, that's on us to take care of. What we're gonna do here um, is curbside pickup for everybody. So we've been reaching out to different uh, companies. One, co we work with Republic Services in our other communities. So we most likely will go with them, but that hasn't been determined as a, a, a final determination, uh, but it would be cur weekly curbside pickup. For the clubhouse it, as well, somebody would staff that and roll it out every week? Yeah, that, yes, to, we would figure that out as far as specifically for the clubhouse. Somebody goes up, empties the trash once a week and puts it out. We don't need like a dumpster yeah. enclosure that we need to get screened? I don't think so. Whatever. I mean, I don't think there'll be enough use up there. I think as long as you know, we'll have, whether it's myself or John or you know, in our other communities, we have a uh, community manager. Uh, so we'll work through that. We plan on having you know some type of manager out there because we need somebody on call 24/7 in the case there's an emergency. Right. Yeah, you know, that's another thing that that we have in all our communities. Yeah. Okay, those are my comments. Thank you, Charlie. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Well, anything else? All set. Thank you. Okay. Oh, all set. Jeff. Jeff, anything else? Well, I think you already did check with him. I keep forgetting. No, I have him. nothing. Uh, nothing further to add. Great. <clears throat> So do we need a motion then to continue? Yes, to continue to, let me just check, I believe July 12th at 635. 
in this building. Yes, July 12th, 635. Okay, so we we'll make a motion then. So moved. So moved, Chris. Second. Second. Okay, discussion, all in favor? Aye. Jeff, are you in on that? Aye. Aye, very good. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any old or new business? Nope. 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 Um, anything else, Gene, that you'd like to bring up? No. Okay, we'll have a motion to adjourn that. So Should we get a second over here, Wally? All in favor? Aye. 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 Jeff, I'm sure you'll go along with that. Yeah. All right. Take care. I wonder if they changed something. Maybe that was theirs. July 12th. I won't be in Twitter, but I'll be in there. I really do. Those reds better too. No things are coming out. No. All right. Do you want this? Always good coming out. Yeah, actually, one of my favorite. Did you get all the staff comments? Did I get your staff comments? Maybe. Do you, you want to take my? Um, you find it if they want. <laughs> I, like some of the I just started. Oh,